Almost a quarter of a century later since its initial release, with another supposed remake in the works, we look back on the PS1 classic by famed developer Hideo Kojima, Metal Gear Solid. This is the first PS1 game I ever owned. I actually didn't finish it until years later. Being a child at the time, you can imagine I didn't care much for the game. I preferred platformers like Crash and Spyro. Only when I finished it years later did I come to appreciate it. Anyway, let's not waste any more time and jump right in. Narration explains when you boot up the game the mission objectives. Basically legendary hero Solid Snake enters a nuclear disposal facility to stop a bunch of terrorists. Under the command of a man called Liquid, despite its Japanese development team, it's got a very western style story and setting. Initially the story seems simple. If you've ever watched or read any of Tom Clancy's work, or know anything about the shenanigans James Bond gets up to, it initially follows the same basic formula. How the plot gets confusing almost instantly is by the fact that the story is carrying the baggage of the two previous 2D Metal Gear games that released on the MSX. Now, let's face it, no one played those games. Well, at least not at the time this released in the West anyway. You can get the gist of what you need to know with the optional briefings contained in the main menu. These are framed quite nicely, a snake being pulled out of retirement before quickly being given the mission and set out to Shadow Moses. This is quite analogous to the feelings of the player. Snake is probably as confused and indifferent as the player. Just point us to where the action is. You also have the two previous MSX games plots given in summary as text in the main menu. I'm glad it's there, but just having it in text is a bit plain. I'm not saying they needed much here. Maybe some comic style artwork or a narration by David Hayter could have spiced this up a little. Now, although this stuff is important, the plot is definitely telling its own story here. The game starts with Snake entering the base by water, and we enter a brief codec conversation. Snake will have a whole support team helping him on his mission, which will chime in whenever necessary. Now, with a game's tone as serious as this one, you would think it would be quite jarring for an in-game character to announce out loud the buttons you need to press on the controller. When you want to use the codec, push the select button. However, it surprisingly works to little ill effect. This starts at the tutorial level of sorts. A snake needs to wait for the elevator. You can actually go back and enter the water, which is a nice detail and I thought it was prepping me for something later in the game. But being able to go into the water never shows up again, which is why it's so strange to begin with. Anyhow, here you get an idea of the controls, the radar and the guard sensors. Since snake only has a tiny health bar at this point, with no real way to defend himself, most players will probably get caught and die a few times here. So it shows through its gameplay Staying out of sight is best. Since I've played the game before, I obviously make it through with no problems. After this, we get the title screen and the real mission begins. Here we are introduced to the crew for the mission in the codec. This shows off the game's voice acting and the cinematic presentation, while walking us through the game's soliton radar system. Characters say a few times throughout that certain objects were made with currently existing technology. Yes, it's all made from currently existing technology. And to this day, that phrase makes no sense to me. Oh, currently existing technology? Thanks for letting me know. I thought it might be from the future or a different dimension. Silly me. I can only assume they meant state of the art and it was mistranslated. Being a stealth game, you can imagine it's about avoiding detection. And herein lies the first major issue. We're walking with an overhead camera here, that is incredibly pulled in. I don't know much about the PS1's limitations, but I feel certain in saying that the camera placement is due to the hardware constraints. So, the first person mode and the vector based radar are key for getting through a level. Even with these tools to help, you still have this bizarre thing that can happen, where Snake can just walk in front of an enemy or camera you literally couldn't see, which just wouldn't happen for Snake in reality. So, to use that buzzword in games criticism, there's a bit of ludo narrative dissonance going on, although I've never cared for the term. From a gameplay perspective, it kind of feels like you're playing with one eye most of the time. It never feels like you're getting the full picture, making the radar crucial, meaning the parts when they take it away from you, like during the alert phase, actually impactful. The controls are just okay, the d-pad for movement gets the job done, although its stiffness can be a pain. The PS3 version I'm playing supports full analog controls, 
which makes it a lot more tolerable. Even still, the more precise controls of the D-pad meant it still had its uses, so I found myself using both. Stealth is an all or nothing affair. You're either hidden or caught. Being caught will have the guard swarm snake, kicks up the music, and has a big flashing alert symbol accompanying a giant timer counting down, all to create a sense of panic as you scramble for a place to hide. Then the guards will all but forgotten about Snake's existence as he hides for only a brief moment. So, despite its Hollywood-like story, cutscenes and voice acting, it still very much has an old-school attitude in its game design. Combine all these factors together, and it means the gameplay in a lot of ways is very arcade-like. The camera placement, bodies disappearing after death, the floating rotating items, the sound effects, and just how the stealth system works, all give the game an arcade-like experience. Impressive. Metal Gear Solid exists in this pseudo-narrative where real-world history is used as a backdrop for all the fantastic elements Hideo Kojima likes to throw in. Because of this, the strange elements actually feel like they're integrated in real-world logic. Now, I'm not a scientist, but if we had, for example, a process to change someone's genes after conception in the game known as Gene Therapy, it's very logical the military would use that to make better fighters, as the game does with the genome soldiers. Psycho Mantis and Decoy Octopus would be more great examples, as they exist in a way you'd imagine a psychic and a shapeshifter would walk in a military unit. You might think the story would clash with the gameplay, you know, to have a story taken this seriously about a fundamental question, then are we anything more than what our genes coded us to be? To have this then mixed with the gameplay for a 2D arcade game ripped straight out of the generation before. However, I think this is where the blocky graphics helps the game out. Hearing a blocky polygon face jitter as a primitive form of facial animation, listening to a talk about being able to find love in the strangest of places, means the player's imagination is already doing a lot of the work. You're already working with the suspension of disbelief in the graphics. So, the gameplay, in a strange way, gels with that low poly presentation, and the story's fort wall breaking, matched with the more fantastical elements, like the cyborg ninja, means the gameplay never feels out of place. This is probably why as the franchise graphics and animations got better over the generations, the less arcade-like the gameplay got. The realistic graphics and setting of the future games would mix well with this type of gameplay. That's not to say the gameplay is from a bygone era. It still has some notable little touches that stand out to this day. The game's enemies, the genome soldiers, are for the time in some ways impressive. Some will sneeze from the cold. One will periodically go to the bathroom. They'll investigate your cardboard box if it's in an odd place. They'll notice footprints in the snow and track nearby noises the player makes. However, as impressive as these were for the time, the game kind of sets itself up for disaster by Naomi saying, The genome soldiers have highly developed senses of hearing and vision due to their gene therapy. Make sure you don't let them see you. Only to have these so-called super soldiers walking around with a tiny vision range, and laughable AI that's easy to exploit. Snake is there to assess whether the terrorists, which just so happens to be his former unit Foxhound, can launch a nuclear missile. We get some answers when you crawl through the vents and meet up with the DARPA chief. Turns out this isn't a nuclear disposal facility. Instead, a testing ground for the new Metal Gear Rex. Yeah, Rex. The late 90s really loved its dinosaurs. The terrorists need two codes to launch, with the DARPA chief already having given up his. The chief will hand Snake his keycard, and we find another grievance I have with the plot, as he explains in excruciating detail how the car key works. It's called a pan car. It works together with your body's own electrical field. Personal area network, huh? It transmits data using the salts in your body as the transmission medium. As you approach the door's security devices, they'll read the data stored in the card. And the doors will open automatically. Gotcha. This is a game with a bullet-cutting cyborg ninja and a telepathic super soldier just to name a few of the strange things with no explanation, which is a good thing in my opinion. Yet the game gets bogged down constantly, explaining every little thing. Like how said card key works, which pad out the cutscene's length 
and waste time. Anyway, most importantly we're told the arms tech president has the needed keycards that can stop Rex from launching a nuke. The Darth Chief begins prying Snake for information, before mysteriously dying from a heart attack. With no explanation to why as of yet, we press on with the mission. Here we're introduced to Campbell's niece, Meryl. Her and Snake take part in almost a shooting tutorial of sorts, as the game rushes us with waves of enemies. The shooting controls are clunky and stiff, all too often you're shooting into space, hoping you're lining up with the enemy on the radar. Thankfully, the game's auto-aim system does most of the work, so it never becomes a major issue. To be fair to the controls in general, with one exception later, the game never asked the player to do something that the controls on the level wasn't specifically designed for. I like the fact that Meryl struggling to shoot the guards happens in real time for the most part. It's one thing for Snake to say that she's a rookie, and another for the game to show it. Mantis appears for a brief moment, and Meryl escapes on the elevator. The game makes damn sure we focus on Meryl's polygon rear end, and we're back to our own devices. With the DARPA chief dead, we move on to finding the arms tech president Kenneth Baker. A floor below, we blow up some walls with some C4, and so begins the first boss fight with Revolver Ocelot. It's a decent first boss. Snake having such a small health bar and a limited perspective, combined with the center of the area off limits due to Baker being strapped up to C4, it's trickier than you might think. There is a bit of strange sexual tension in this fight, with Ocelot describing how he enjoys loading his gun in vivid detail. I love to reload during a battle. There's nothing like the feeling of slamming a long silver bullet into a well reached chamber. With Hideo, I have no idea if this was intentional or not. In the Twin Snakes remake, this boss fight is ruined by how the fuss passing aiming makes it ridiculously easy to headshot Ocelot. Anyway, after beating him, a ninja shows up chopping off Ocelot's hand, somehow saving Baker in the process. Unharmed I might add, and to this day, I still have no idea how, before having some sort of spasm and leaving. I actually love Snake's joke about Ocelot's hand here. What happened to your arm? He broke it. Looks like you're more than even now, his was sliced off. Ha, huh, you're a funny man. Really makes him a more likeable personality. Speaking of Snake as a character, he's a bit of a mishmash of a lot of late 80s, early 90s action stars. In most ways, he's almost a foreigner's view of the heroic American soldier that they could see in movies and other propaganda media. An idolised image of their war heroes that someone could have internalised from years of exposure to American media. With that said, there's way more to him than most action movie characters, and he's unique in his own way. Not just the fact that he's a clone. Sure, he's heroic, brave, and skilled. Not to mention, he has all the women in the game falling head over heels for him. I just didn't expect a world-class designer of military technology to be so... cute. <laughs> You're just flattering me. On the other hand, he's also a trained killer. How coldly he ends people's lives throughout the game definitely calls into question how much of an actual hero he is. In fact, the story often questions whether or not Snake is doing the things he does for his own selfish desires. The fact, for example, he might enjoy all the killing, and that's why he makes such a great soldier. It's perhaps by today's standards a little derivative. However, keep in mind, this is coming from a PS1 game in 98, whose game characters were known for this. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Barry, thanks for saving my life. Not exactly characters, but emotion and feelings, were they? Here Baker tells Snake that he gave up his detonation code too, with the terrorists having both codes, forces Snake to use the keycard method instead. Baker gave the keycard to Meryl, meaning we'll have to find her. Baker tells Snake her frequency is on the back of the CD case. This is one of those Hideo Kojima things he became famous for, hiding Meryl's frequency on the actual back of the game case. As a child, I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought he meant the optical disc he gives you shortly after. With no internet at the time, I just brute forced it by trying every single frequency code. Thankfully, the frequency is just 15 away from zero, so it didn't take too long. Maybe this was intentional, who knows. In the PS3 version, they just outright tell you in the digital manual. Baker points you in the direction of Hal Emmerich, the Metal Gear Rex designer, to see if he knows any other way to stop it. 
So, we need to contact Merrill and head over to the nuclear storage facility in the north to locate Hal. All your goals in the game are always very clearly defined. Here, for example, Baker explains everything very neatly and concisely. If he just handed over the optical disc and died, it would have been really well done. Except he then continues for another five minutes about his company, nuclear war, and military black projects. It's interesting, sure, and adds more real life layers to the story, but crucial, no. Everything he says could be in a document somewhere, or have Campbell tell you about it later over an optional codec conversation. This is a persistent problem with Kojima's writing in general. He loves to hit you over the head with complicated information on top of more complicated information to almost a laughable degree. And by the time you're grasping what's going on, you often then get a reveal shortly after telling you everything you heard up to now is a lie anyway. I gave Snake praise there as a character a few moments ago, and deservedly so. With that said, how Snake is utilised in some of these cutscenes and codec conversations is downright ridiculous. Characters talk about long-winded information for so long, Snake will often repeat a keyword in their sentence back to them. It's a technique, and a poor one at that. Writers use so characters speaking can go into more detail about a topic. Snake does it so often, it's literally become a joke about Snake at this stage in the franchise. What? Magical implants. Evolution. Psychomantis. Second floor basement. Woman. Who? What? Metal gear. Turkeys. Often it's used because I think you would forget Snake was in the room. People monologue for such a great length of time, you'd forget that they were in a two person conversation if Snake didn't repeat a few words back. In fairness, it's only notable during the DARPA chief and the Baker scenes. However, when it's become a famous trait about your main character, you know it's become a problem. Baker is another victim that dies from a supposed heart attack, so we press on with the mission to contact Merrill. Merrill's character is interesting in the sense that she has her own goals not related to Snake's mission. Most characters in games feel like they're there for the player's needs, not their own. Much like Snake's support team, maybe with exception to Naomi. Meryl is on her own mission to see if she's cut out to be a soldier. It's not anything special, but at the very least her inexperience contrasts well with Snake. Talking to Meryl starts a trend of too much time spent in the codec conversations. To be fair, it's not that they're necessarily too long or uninteresting. Most of them contain a lot of the great character moments. It's by the fact that they're often bunched together. Take where I'm at in the game here as a small example. You have a codec conversation after Baker dies. You'll probably save after, so Mei Ling will give you some words of wisdom. Then you leave the area and go up the elevator, and have another long codec conversation with Meryl. When she opens the cargo door, she'll call you back, and again when you walk up to the entrance, to tell the player about the lasers. After the player gets through the lasers, Deep Throat, yeah, Deep Throat, maybe the worst code name ever. He calls to tell you about the mines in the area. Hopefully you've seen how it's becoming excessive. Now, a lot of this would be hard to remove without restructuring the game entirely. However, a lot of the time the support team chime in to tell you about a button you need to press or an action you need to take, which could have been played in real time instead of bringing us to the codec, helping to stop interrupting the flow. Here you fight Vulcan Raven, but really you're battling the tank he's in, which is kind of disappointing. Every boss has a bit of a hide and seek vibe going for it. However, this one you're just running around chucking grenades at it which makes a lot of sense to defeat a tank, but in comparison to all the other bosses, and the fact that you're fighting a hulking machine, it's a fairly weak and anticlimactic boss. In the next area, there was live nuclear warheads, and it means Snake can't use his gun. Like with the water, it's this one area, and it never shows up again. Why MGS comes up with these game mechanics or small gimmicks, and never fully utilises them, is almost as strange as the games themselves. The guards also have no problem shooting Snake either blowing the whole facility up, and it's a shame, because this is one of those times where they could have shown off the intelligence of the enemy AI. From a story perspective, I think the fact that Naomi stops Snake using the nano machines in his body is a subtle hint towards the fact that Snake is just a puppet they control. Anyway, down the elevator, we pilot a remote controlled missile to destroy an electrified floor, in a surprisingly fun little segment. Here the area is filled with gas. The way items and weapons work means you can only have one selected of each at any given time. And it's a system that works fine, except here. Constantly having to change between the gas mask 
and the card key just to check her room is a real pain. After that, there was a great build up to the next boss fight, the Cyborg Ninja. The hallway before the boss fight looks like something out of a horror game, and the ninja looks like something out of one of my Japanese animes. The boss fight is enjoyable, and who turns out to be Grey Fox will pause and talk during the fight, giving it a lot more personality. It's another one of those underlining homoerotic boss fights. It's a bit of a shame that we're fighting a bullet cutting ninja, yet all we do is punch it to death, but it's an enjoyable boss fight all the same. Hal here, otherwise known as Articon, is a great example that is left out of most anti-war stories. Often the people that do the most damage in war are the scientists and engineers developing the weapons. They're often kept out of the loop. People with good intentions that are naively used by the military industrial complex. Articons love robots and animes a bit much, but does a decent job of showing that he is just a man who wanted to make the things he loved as a child a reality, with the military using that to further its own agenda. Kojima honestly does a good job of showing how war is just a power game, and it often uses the people it pretends to protect. Articon tells us where Metal Gear is, with finding and shutting it down being the main goal for the rest of the game. There was a funny moment where Snake thinks Articon is going to have a heart attack when he hands Snake his keycard. It's a very natural joke that occurs, and you can't really blame Snake for thinking it. Wrong, getting all friendly all of a sudden. No, nothing. I'm glad you're okay. You're strange. I'm a little nervous. Everyone else I've saved suddenly dies. We then use Meryl's funny walk to locate her on the floor below, and we meet up with her in the women's bathroom. Snake in essence gives her a wake up call on what it takes to be a real soldier, which is punctuated well in the next boss fight. Psycho Mantis. It's arguably the game's claim to fame. His introduction causes the game to act funny, with Meryl acting strange and TV glitches appearing with the name of the developer. Mantis being a psychic, he'll analyse your playstyle up to now, and attempts to read your memory card. As you probably guessed, Mantis was in awe of my gameplay. You're a careless man, aren't you? The fort wall breaking here actually gives the game an eerie feeling like the game has been secretly watching you this whole time. You can't physically hurt Mantis because he can read your every move, so you have to change the controller into port 2, which is admittedly less exciting on the PS3 version. However, when you change the port and hit him for the first time, it's a great feeling. The fight is pretty standard after that point. Mantis's death scene after is well done though. You can argue it goes on too long, and you probably wouldn't be wrong. However, the boss death scenes contains the most substance about Snake as a character himself. For instance, despite Mantis wanting to murder as many people as he could, after looking into Snake's mind, Mantis now doesn't consider himself nearly as bad. You're just like the boss. No, you're worse. Compared to you, I'm not so bad. It goes to show what it takes to be a legendary hero. You almost need to be as single-minded and as ruthless as the villains. Despite the flack I've given Kojima, and there's more of it to come, the man is never dull and always has interesting ideas. But how he uses and implements them is another thing entirely. Next is a small cave and some wolves. Down a large hallway, Mel gets shot by Sniper Wolf, culminating in her bleeding out and realising she's not cut out to be a soldier like Snake, in a well done emotional scene. I promised. I wouldn't slow you down. I. I. I, I can still help. Snake can only stand back and watch. Meryl is somewhat a subversion of the Bond girl, as trying to follow in the image of the hero ends up with her getting shot. As I've said, the character moments are there, and most of them are well done. Here, you need to backtrack to the main base to get a sniper. From a pacing perspective, it's the right thing to do. The player needs some time to slow the game down again, and get back to the stealth gameplay. Because if not, we would have had three boss fights, with Grey Fox, Mantis and Sniper Wolf back to back, which would have been too much. And keep in mind, we're playing a stealth game here, not a boss rush. It's why I think they keep this backtracking in the remake, with Meryl bleeding out, adding an underlying urgency to the situation. But gameplay wise, it's a waste of the player's time, and feels like padding to extend the game's length. MGS1 is a fun game to come back to, but this and one other backtracking section always has me reconsidering. The fight with Wolf would be enjoyable, if it wasn't for the controls. They just weren't built for this style of boss. 
Snake goes prone to shoot his sniper rifle, and there is a delay in the control until you're zoomed in fully. We're so zoomed in with the sniper scope, it gives you tunnel vision, so it's difficult to control and get your bearings. The movement jitter is ridiculous, but that can be solved with the Pentazami. However, if she hits you, it throws your aim across the map, and by the time you line back up, she'll probably hit you again, putting the player in a very annoying cycle. It's not difficult, I only died once, and that's because I forgot to equip my ration, but my lord is a frustrating. The fight is sort of pointless, the snake gets captured anyway. This begins a very novel segment where you're being tortured by Ocelot and stuck in a cell at a rotting DARPA chief, who is another well done fort wall break, as Ocelot threatens the player's actual save, and says he'll know if you're cheating during your torture. Whacking the suckle button, or any button for that matter, as fast as you can, is fairly annoying in any game, and here is no exception. Ocelot makes it sound like a huge deal, but in actual reality, all it does is make the ending play out at Merrill if you survive, or Otacon if you submit. Although, the ending message gets across regardless of the outcome, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. I managed to hide under my bed from the guard Johnny and escape. Now once again you backtrack to where you were, padding out the game more. However, the bomb in your inventory was a nice touch. This starts a lot of scripted segments, with you running up some stairs with guards chasing you, repelling down the tower, away from liquid in the hind D, and so on and so forth. It finally culminates in an actual boss fight with the thing. Trying to get across to the other tower to fight the damn thing was fairly annoying. With three guards blocking the bridge, I tried blowing them up with a remote controlled missile, but they kept respawning, so I thought it was going the wrong way. Instead, you have to use the sniper to kill them, which is fine, but what's wrong with using the missile instead? Before the fight, Otacon comes to see you, to find out whether or not love can bloom on the battlefield. This is because he's secretly in love with Sniper Wolf. Apart from a bit of an odd placement, it's a nice moment. As things get more dire, both characters seem to be reflecting on the chances they should be taking. Now, I think Snake's speech about love can be a bit over the top, but the voice acting really makes it work. Anyway, the Hind D fight. It's waiting to fire missiles back, in between hails a gunfire. Later starts a bit of a hide and seek segment, as it dips below and you wait for it to come out. It's simple, but enjoyable. There's a fun set piece in an elevator against the visible guards. And shortly after that, it's a rematch between Snake and Sniper Wolf. It's a slightly expanded fight, but suffers from a lot of the same shortcomings, which I won't repeat. Wolf gets a nice death scene though, with all the con and tears, and with Snake dealing the final blow. Sniper Wolf constantly refers to Snake as a hero, likely in a degrading way. Just for him to kill her out remorse. This scene really emphasizes Snake as a stone cold killer, far from any atypical hero. Wolf's hero remarks are really to show there's nothing heroic about him. He's a trained killer, just like them. A lot of these death scenes save the villains from being nothing more than a boss, and makes them actual characters. Kojima has struggled in the later games to do the same with similar bosses, so it's strange how much he gets right here the first time. Now we move on to disc 2. There was only one last sneaking segment in the game here in the furnace. Shortly after is the Vulcan Raven fight. Before the fight, Vulcan Raven tells us about the Eskimo Indian Olympics. Metal Gear Solid has a lot of quirky little things going for it that's now become a staple of the franchise. For instance, Mei Ling giving you words of wisdom after you've saved, or Psycho Mantis reading your memory card for other Konami games. It's a few enjoyable little features that doesn't impede on the overall experience. In fact, things like Mantis reading your memory card makes a lot of sense for a psychic, and elevates that boss from mediocrity. However, Vulcan Raven explaining how he's really good at the ear pulling or the muck tuck eating contest, I can't help but feel the game is wasting my time with needless information. The fight on the other hand is fantastic, with staying out of Vulcan's huge line of sight being your greatest advantage. A lot of Snake's equipment and weapons are often of very limited use, a one and done sort of thing. Here, nearly every weapon is useful in some way, really justifying Snake's plethora of weapons. However, there is one major change I would make. Halfway through the fight, the game would block certain pathways to up the difficulty. Instead, they should have turned off the radar at some point, maybe at one third his health bar. I have to think this was meant to be the case at some point, because Raven will stop every 10 seconds or so and start screaming and shooting, announcing his position on the map, which seems pointless if the player can just see him on the radar the whole time. Regardless, it's still one of the best boss fights the franchise has ever done. 
After this, we finally make it to Metal Gear. Snake manages to listen in on a conversation between Liquid and Ocelot. Rex's safety has been disengaged, and the terrorists can launch at any time. Liquid wants to expose US involvement in the development of Metal Gear, in order to get the US's enemies on his side, more or less, forcing the president to give in to Liquid's demands. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, and there's many more subplots going on around it. So, all you need to know is that Liquid wants world domination, and you're set. With Metal Gear activated, Snake needs to shut it down with three keys. It begins by Snake losing the key at the bottom of the Metal Gear platform, and having to search for it. This starts a horrible backtracking segment, where Snake needs to climb to the top and bottom of Metal Gear multiple times. Snake needs to change the shape of the key by exposing it to different temperatures. This means backtracking to different areas, then back to the control room on top of Metal Gear. It's a drawn out segment to fit in more story stuff, and artificially extend the game's length. Here you learn about Fox Die, a virus Snake was injected with to kill all the members of Foxhound by Snake coming in contact with them. This is what kills both the DARPA Chief and Baker. Since Ocelot killed the real one, the DARPA Chief was actually Decoy Octopus, and was trying to get the detonation codes from Snake. Miller exposes Naomi, who betrayed the group, and she's actually working for herself to get revenge on Snake for Grey Fox. Due to her, Fox Die isn't working as intended, so it's why all the characters you've come in contact with haven't dropped dead yet. Anyway, more complicated shenanigans later, and Snake inputs the final key card. This actually activates Metal Gear. Turns out Master Miller, Snake's plucky friend from Alaska, was actually Liquid, Snake's clone twin brother. A snake has been you unintentionally working with the terrorists you this whole time. Done. Liquid couldn't activate Metal Gear due to not having both codes, so Snake was used instead. Now, why Liquid was trying to kill Snake this whole time means the twist tends to create more problems than it solves. That aside, Metal Gear is up and running, which kicks off a boss fight with Rex. The first stage is easy enough, throw chaff grenades and hit it with missiles. Grey Fox then appears which leads to a scene where he tells the truth about him and Naomi's relationship. Now, this video is long enough as it is, so I'm not gonna go into it. Anyway, he sacrifices himself in a well done emotional scene, which begins the second stage of the fight, to which I stand on the Metal Gear and shoot it with missiles from below. I have no idea if this was developer intended, but it worked for me as a child and I've never changed my strategy since. Liquid seemingly dies so often in this game, it's almost comical. We're meant to believe Snake got knocked out from Metal Gear exploding, yet Liquid is controlling the damn thing from the inside and he's fine. Anyway, the Pentagon has had enough and they plan to blow the facility up. Not before Liquid talks a great deal about genes and wants to have one final fist fight with Snake. Before we continue, let's talk about the problems I had with the story. The biggest problem with the story is that there's too much of it. It's plot after plot after more countless subplots packed on top of each other. Stopping Metal Gear seems like the main focus, and it is for a huge portion of the game. However, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's really about Liquid, trying to recreate a superior out of heaven, in order to show how much better he is than Snake and the father Big Boss, because he believes he's been given the recessive genes of Big Boss and Snake the dominant ones, which isn't actually true, and recessive genes are not necessarily a bad thing, which Snake himself ultimately proves, as Snake has had the recessive genes this whole time. So, for how much Liquid talks about the science of genes in the last section of the game, he can't even get it right. That's not to mention the deal he's trying to make with the Russians. The Secretary of Defense conspiring against the White House, with Snake is a ploy to get the Metal Gear test data, Snake being injected with Fox Die to kill all the terrorists by just coming in contact with them, Decoy Octopus being the DARPA chief, trying to use Snake in order to get the access codes for Metal Gear. The fact that the terrorists can't activate Metal Gear and are using Snake as a pawn to do it. All this is not to mention the subplots between Naomi and Snake, Snake and Grey Fox, and the history between Grey Fox and Naomi that leads her to trying to kill Snake in the first place. And that's not even just the half of it, it goes on and on and on. Look, it leads to some interesting twists and turns along the way, and these twists and turns have become a staple of the franchise at this point. And, in fairness, if you rifle through all the story layers, everything just about adds up and makes sense for the most part. However, the story in practice is just mostly overly long codec conversations 
after overly long codec conversations. It's all reasonably well written and voice acted, there's just far too much of it. I would give Hideo the benefit of the doubt, as I can only imagine he did all this to pack in all the best ideas into the game just in case it never got a sequel. But Hideo's game philosophy of laying too many ideas on top of each other only got worse as time went on, and this is coming from a guy who is nothing but respect for the man. Anyway, we punch Liquid off of Metal Gear in a decent climactic boss fight. Here Snake and Meryl drive to the surface, not before Liquid appears again. It's quite hard to hit Liquid here, and it's funny because he seems to be having an easier time hitting us despite the fact that he's driving, aiming and shooting all at the same time. Once we reach the end, they crash at the exterior entrance, with Snake and Meryl being trapped. Liquid comes to finish the job, except in the last moment he dies from the Fox Die virus. The game ends with Campbell stopping the place from being blown to Kingdom Come, with both characters driving off into the distance, with Snake wondering why he got to live and Liquid died, ending on some lines from Naomi to not let your life be controlled by your genes. Yeah, the core team around Metal Gear Solid is genes, if it wasn't obvious enough. You have Naomi and Genesis, the genome soldiers, Mantis talks about life being our selfish desires to pass on our genes. You've got the Fox Die virus, which targets people's genetic code. Finally, we have Liquid and Snake, who were cloned from Big Boss's genes. The first game, about the hero and the villain being clones, genes as a team, fits in nicely. It's a fundamental question a clone might have. Do your genes set you down a predetermined path, or can you live outside them? And the game tackles this subject matter well, with the game ending on the message that your genes are only as important as you make them out to be. It's a great message to end a story, let alone a PS1 stealth game. With the first game out of the way, let's quickly talk about the remake for the GameCube, The Twin Snakes. I was going to save this for my MGS2 review, because it's practically 2's gameplay ported into 1's engine, and knowing how MGS2 played would save a lot of time, but god knows if I ever made that video. It's got improved graphics and controls, although the GameCube controller comes with its own set of problems. Despite that, it's shocking how much the remake gets wrong. On the positive side, the controls and graphics makes the game worth trying at the very least. They've cut down on a lot of the needless backtracking, which is a plus and there's a couple of things you can do to speed through things. However, nearly every decision made for this remake was the wrong decision. They redid all the voice acting, and I'd struggle to call it a success. To start, they got rid of all the accents. Okay, it's not a deal breaker, but it really cuts out a lot of the charm of the original. Nice to meet you, Snake. It's an honor to speak to a, a living legend like yourself. Nice to meet you, Snake. It's an honor to speak to a living legend like yourself. Second, the voice acting is weaker across the board overall. Finally, the change in the voice actor for Grey Fox. This might be the biggest mistake in terms of the acting, turning in a very weak performance in comparison to the original. The tranquilizer gun and the controls, which now allow you to aim and shoot in first person. This was not built with MGS1's levels in mind, which makes sneaking through certain areas a cakewalk, as you can walk into a new area and headshot everything on the map. They also brought over MGS2's overly long caution phase, which was once a way to bring the player out of hiding. Here in the remake, it's just an annoyance, constantly dragging out the encounters. As I said earlier, most bosses are criminally easy with the first person aiming. Every cutscene in the game has been made more drawn out, and added a stupid level of slow motion in nearly every interaction. All subtlety has gone out the window, and characters are doing somersaults and backflips at every opportunity. Some character moments are literally ruined by the changes. To illustrate how bad the remake can get, I'll show you a small example. Here in the original, when Baker says he can't remember Mel's code, Snake shows he's clearly frustrated, before calming himself very quickly. I forgot. Damn! Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the CD case. The man is a trained professional after all. He can handle bad news. Now let's look at the remake. I forgot. Damn! Oh, that's right. It should be on the back of the package. He spasms out like a crack addict and points his gun to Baker's head. It's only two small changes, but in one, he's a trained professional, like the game espouses. 
The other, he's a deranged psycho, shouldn't be allowed carry a gun. The single biggest mistake was the music. I'll fully admit the allot music in one kind of wore out its welcome by the end, but what they've replaced it here with is dreadful, and the replacement for every track in comparison to the original is overall weaker. After all the needless changes they made in the remake, decided to keep the codename Deep Throat. One actual change I would have understood. By all means give it a try, but please do not play this game over the original. To wrap up, if they ever do another remake, it's highly unlikely Kojima would have any involvement. In fact, I'd say he's happier to see the franchise behind him. Like Solid Snake was made in the image of Big Boss, but never strived to become him, I hope whoever replaces Hideo will keep that in mind. Metal Gear Solid came out at a time when games lacked any real quality when it came to telling a story on power a movie. The franchise changed that. In a lot of ways, the Metal Gear series has been ahead of its time, and Hideo has never been afraid to alienate his own fanbase, and take the franchise in strange new directions. But knowing now how the franchise ultimately ended, it's nice to look back on the franchise that created the trends, not follow them. This has been Jamie on Metal Gear Solid, and if you've made it this far into the video, I want to thank you for watching.